я думаю, что я, если нет никаких вопросов, то мы тогда приступим уже к работе конференции. Коллеги, есть какие-то вопросы? Да, по поводу вопросов. Вопросы к докладчику вы можете задавать как в формате устного общения, то есть, собственно говоря, задавать вопрос в голосовом варианте. Также есть чат, который кнопка, иконка внизу, можно вопросы задавать в чате. Я буду за этим следить. Спасибо вам большое. Есть вопросы? Ну, тогда успехов нам, удачи и хорошего настроения. Так распорядились устроители, что мой доклад будет первым. Видно ли мою презентацию? Коллеги, видно ли презентацию? Хотя, хотя бы да. Спасибо. Да, все видно. Но, к сожалению, я не могу ее увеличить, потому что кнопка F5 у меня отказывается работать в зуме, поэтому пока будем в таком формате. Сегодня речь пойдет в моем докладе о такой очень важной, важном параметре обучения, как оценка. И оценка именно в рамках компетентностного подхода. Потому что мы все работаем в рамках компетентностного под подхода, все стандарты уже написаны а, в рамках компетентностного подхода, то есть а, стандарт а, государственный, образовательный закладывает нам те компетенции, которые мы должны а, сформировать у наших студентов. Так случилось, что по своей научной деятельности и педагогической деятельности я являюсь разработчиком стандартов и одновременно много работаю с анализом тех компетенций, которые представлены в стандартах. И я хочу вам сказать, что этот анализ, он достаточно печальные результаты показывает. Эти результаты состоят прежде всего в том, что Результативные характеристики, которые появляются в стандартах, они буквально всех форм и размеров. То есть это очень разнородные единицы, которые указываются как компетенции результативные, то, что должен освоить студент в процессе иноязычной подготовки. Они разного объема по содержанию, они разного уровня психической реализации. Они могут быть сформулированы как на уровне каких-то языковых единиц, или как виды речевой деятельности, или вообще на уровне общения. В качестве примера мне бы хотелось вам показать, например, с коммуникативные компетенции, как они сформулированы в стандарте у юристов. Я брала стандарт МГИМО именно потому, что МГИМО готовит международников, и, соответственно, там очень большая часть языковой подготовки, профессиональной языковой подготовки, и достаточно подробно описаны результативные характеристики. Но если мы посмотрим на то, в каких единицах это выражено, то выпускник должен и на уровне общения оперировать языком, ну, вот такая компетентность, как компетенция, как способность пользоваться иностранным языком, как средством делового общения, и одновременно указывается достаточно узкий уровень с позиции компетентностного подхода. Это такой, как владение профессиональной терминологией. Или, например, чисто в плане речевой, речевой деятельности ее типа это владение юридически корректной письменной речью. То есть речь идет о том, что на уровне магистратуры у нас нет единого профиля и единого понимания того, что должен делать специалист на выходе. Это одна проблема. Другая проблема, которой мы занимались в процессе исследования, мы делали это исследование именно по юридическим специальностям. Но тут я хочу обратить ваше внимание на то, что, так, на то, что мы анализировали стандарты и бакалавриата тоже, и получив совокупность вот этих профессиональных компетенций, которая была одобрена профессиональным сообществом юридическим, мы пытались найти, насколько, насколько например, профессиональный кембридж. 
professional Cambridge examination reflects uh, this uh, requirement of the employers of a foreign language. Uh, we uh, analyzed uh, the assessment criteria for IELTS examination, which is not carried out here, unfortunately, any longer. But we uh, elaborated the procedures and discovered that even the professional uh, examination does not cover all the competencies which the professional community requires. In some parts of their assessment, the main attention is given to a language uh, skills. And uh, that creates the following problem for us. If researchers, uh, teachers, teachers of foreign languages uh, want to follow the competence approach uh, the way we understand it in the pedagogical community, some of the community, and we uh, separate competencies and competence as such. Competencies are smaller units in size than competence as a resultative unit. So to make it clearer, we say that the person is competent in, in something. And uh, when we use uh, this term in this context, then the, the inevitable comes. Then we talk about uh, people, personal qualities, because competence in this meaning is a quality, a quality which belongs to an individual. This is a general, generalized, the integral system, uh, system quality of an individual, because competence comprises not only skills and knowledge, otherwise we would not live to a new para paradigm, but uh, very important aspects, content, uh, motivation, and uh, many details of the experience of an individual experience in acquiring a foreign language, uh, the uh, ability to study, various competence models uh, reflect this. So if we proceed from understanding that we must describe and understand the personal qualities as system inter, inter, integrative qualities, and uh, this quality should be assessed, then uh, we face a whole number of problems. Because as uh, researchers uh, point out, it is not clear then uh, what is competence and what are components of the competence. I will show to you several models of the competence. And second, the approaches have not been elaborated, nor are the assessment methods. Assessment necessary to assess the foreign language uh, use as competence. So re, uh, respect, uh, therefore, consequently, we describe the object of assessment, what is competence. Second, we must identify the specific features of assessing competence because it can, they cannot be limited to just a test. Then what are the measurement procedure and assessment scale which can be used for this purpose? Uh, I will mention the well-known models, but unfortunately they are not used for the time being. This is a model for, for the uh, foreign language competence as one unit. This is the well-known SEFR model, which includes large groups of competences, a model by Bachman and Ivan Eka, which uh, regretfully have not been used so far for the assessment purposes, but it does not preclude the possibility of their use. What is important is to understand the technology of how to use the competence model as a model of a competent personality in a foreign language in order to uh, organize an integrative uh, assessment. The integrative assessment is also a complex matter because it also has characteristics of integrity and comprehensiveness and also the uh, aspect of being a system. It should take a systematic view of an individual 
as a user of a foreign language. Well, uh, my time is running out, therefore, I will just uh, uh, point out that there is an approach, an explanation of how it can be done, how to use the block system of uh, the uh, communicative competence and also example illustration of elaborating the competitive, uh, uh, conf uh, competence which are already in place. I just want to draw your attention to the linear profiles which are mentioned in the a European uh, um, document where the basis, uh, uh, as the basis are used, the different types of speech activities. In some countries, it's a more, a more traditional approach, but in others, uh, there is some uh, creative or new element. And another more advanced level, I think, a graphic level, I will show it to you. And this uh, graphic profile presupposes the existence of blocks which are used for you to assess the competence. From the point of view of a functional approach, a situation, uh, a functional approach, that is uh, what uh, skills should be possessed by a student in the sphere of communication. Such blocks are usually verified by professionals in the field for which these profiles are created. I will uh, draw to a conclusion for the time being, and I have a couple of minutes to take your questions. Thank you. Well, I understand that uh, there are no questions so far. Then uh, we can move to the second uh, presentation which continues the subject of the integration by uh, Larissa Slipsova about uh, the subject language integrated education in high school as the subject of scientific research. Good afternoon, dear colleagues. I hope you can hear me. Somehow I also have technical problems. So if you can all use, if you can all see the slides, so then we'll continue. My co-partner is Elena Selifanova, and I will give to her the floor later on. So we want to offer to your attention the research devoted to studying the integrated learning and uh, the way it is used in higher uh, uni in universities. We'll also try to systemize uh, the international resources, educational resources in this field and hope that the information we offer will be useful for all of those who are interested in this problem. Today, yeah, there are different points of view on how to define the content of CLIL. CLIL is sometimes described as an as approach or technology. In our research, we did not form any objective or, or categorize these definitions because it will be up to specialists and methodology to do it. And uh, we look at CLIL in a broad understanding and the narrow meaning. Therefore, you come across various, you will hear various uh, definitions, various terms. The history starts uh, back in the 19th century, though the term itself originated only in 1994. And uh, it is interesting that originally the technology of integrated learning was used at the level of secondary education. And uh, later on, uh, the pedagogical community encountered a number of difficulties because foreign language teachers and uh, uh, mathematics, physics, biology, these are two different uh, uh, approaches to different professionals uh, with different professional competencies. That's why this clear methodology and its uh, uh, promotion was not very fast. 
at present, uh, there is uh, a scientific community of CLIL, and its task is to discuss the subject, the subject at various venues and in social networks. All of those interested in using uh, this technology can make use of a number of specialized sources of information covering uh, this, uh, this problem. For example, the International Committee on Education and Culture, scientific journals, for example, CLIL Journal of Innovation and Research, the International CLIL Research Journal, the Latin American uh, Journal of, of Content and Language, CLIL Magazine, the Internet Resource Clear Media, and others. Preparing uh, educational materials by, uh, well, by major pub publishing houses, Cambridge University Macmillan House, and also Cambridge Resource Center, which organizes tests of the knowledge of the candidates, which are necessary to teach various subjects in a foreign language. And uh, now my, uh, our report will be continu continued by uh, Elena Selikhanova. Good afternoon. It is true that I will continue with this uh, presentation and want to say that at the present level of development, the sound is not very good, sorry. The, this approach is an efficient way of uh, teaching a foreign language. I apologize for the poor quality of the sound. The uh, publications on Kulil in Russia um, allows a certain amount of conclusions, a certain number of conclusions. Uh, most of the studies uh, uh, concern the competence building uh, approach to language teaching. And uh, um, we should uh, look at this phenomenon uh, through uh, characterizing its essence. And uh, we are talking about uh, such attributes of CLIL, uh, uh, which uh, should be considered as the necessary and essential. And uh, what we're observing is uh, a change uh, in the tune of the publications. The authors uh, focus on CLIL as an interdisciplinary phenomenon and describe uh, the experience uh, of CLIL teaching in uh, various uh, environments, um, suggesting recommendations and uh, focusing on issues and uh, challenges. And uh, that is important uh, to consider in their own national uh, clinical teaching practice, which uh, this kind of uh, teaching technology, um, particularly in the secondary education, uh, uh, is uh, less popular than in the West. And uh, uh, unfortunately, we should say that uh, is uh, partly due to uh, insufficient level of uh, communicative uh, uh, approach to education and uh, language teaching in particular. And uh, this somehow should be improved. Uh, and I would like to emphasize that uh, clearly is a method uh, of uh, both uh, um, learning a language, but mostly learning a specialized subject. Uh, and uh, um, there are uh, foreign language teachers uh, who do master this kind of new technique uh, and method. And uh, the experience uh, of uh, 
implementing CLIL in the Brunsk State University um, is best uh, exemplified uh, through the teaching of the such subject as history of European civilizations uh, in a foreign language. And um, in different years, uh, this uh, subject uh, uh, was presented uh, in Bulgaria and uh, in some other languages, but currently it is being taught uh, in English. Um, first, uh, the uh, key focuses on the content uh, of the material, uh, the attention of both the learner and the teacher uh, is uh, focused uh, on uh, um, such a component uh, as the lexical component, uh, which is uh, uh, given greater emphasis than uh, the grammar component, as distinct from the general English teaching. And uh, the foreign language here is being used to, to address communicative challenges and uh, to solve communicative tasks. Uh, the CLIL teaching also helps uh, form uh, the new skills uh, and components. Uh, when uh, presenting the course of European civilizations in a foreign language, the students uh, are uh, able to uh, get to know the socio-cultural, uh, historical and cultural, ethnic and cultural background uh, of uh, a particular um, environment and uh, at the same time uh, we are forming such components as the um, the mastery of uh, uh, speech and uh, the teaching is uh, undertaken uh, with a view to professionally oriented tasks and uh, individual professional interests of the learners. Uh, as uh, we consider the most general attributes, uh, we should uh, look at the diagram and distinguish between hard and soft components uh, by hard components, we understand the lectures, uh, whereas uh, uh, the soft uh, ones mostly focus on seminars. Uh, and uh, we may also uh, deal with um, monolingual or multilingual classes, um, but uh, the class itself is uh, conducted in a foreign language. Uh, but uh, it may also be that uh, this very course of European civilization has proved uh, uh, quite uh, successful, um, maybe due to the fact that um, it uh, seeks to develop communicative uh, skills and competences, as well as to arouse uh, um, in interest in uh, research and exploration. To sum up uh, what we have uh, discovered, we must say that uh, in forming the socio-cultural um, course, uh, we must uh, say that uh, uh, the clear uh, approach does help uh, a lot. And uh, thank you very much. I do apologize for some technical difficulties. Thank you. Um, I have a question. Uh, do you see any kind of uh, age preferences uh, in starting to implement uh, the CLIL course uh, when uh, we have in mind the higher school? Then uh, uh, um, there is uh, no marked difference uh, between uh, undergraduate or graduate uh, students, but uh, 
the only thing is that uh, some of the notions uh, sometimes uh, uh, may be uh, interpreted uh, differently. When we are talking of adults, uh, there's no uh, difference in approach, whatever. As to uh, secondary school, uh, the clear worker in, for instance, teaching math or history could be an idea uh, for um, senior students. But uh, as to the a variety of subjects or subject selection, or which ones do you think are uh, mostly suitable or could best be adapted to uh, CLIL teaching? Thank you for your question. Uh, initially, CLIL was uh, presented uh, as uh, a tool to teach uh, sciences, uh, natural sciences, uh, but um, speaking on the basis uh, of our uh, experience uh, all depends on the competence and qualification of the teacher um, themselves. Uh, myself, uh, I work at the humanities department uh, and uh, it is uh, quite natural after uh, all to uh, introduce CLIL uh, uh, in teaching a course in uh, humanities uh, as to forming the um, um, some total of notions, uh, and then if uh, um, that may be done in um, sciences, that could be done in humanities as well. A lot depends on the teacher. Thank you, thank you very much for the answers. Do we have more questions, colleagues? Uh, if I may, you're welcome. Um, as far as I can understand, uh, a lecture conducted uh, in a foreign language and a follow-up seminar constitute a CLIL approach. Uh, is that so? In the uh, school where I teach, this has been the standard practice for the history of Germany. I may have overlooked something or misunderstood something. What's the difference? Uh, we. Uh, seem to be dealing with the difference between uh, ESP and CLIL. Uh, and uh, if it's uh, a non-linguistic student or a non-ESP student, then uh, what we are looking at is uh, a CLIL approach. True. Uh, in uh, our university, we do have uh, um, this um, subject uh, as the subject of future profession. I'm talking about the teaching of English and translation and interpreting. And part of their curriculum is uh, um, uh, studies. Uh, of uh, um, regional studies and international relations. Uh, and uh, it's more than just uh, delivering a lecture in a foreign language. Uh, the CLIL technology seeks uh, to uh, form uh, a way of thinking, a mindset, uh, and uh, that is achieved through a set of tasks uh, um, which help her conduct research when uh, teaching the history of uh, England. Uh, I offer students uh, a comparative, uh, an exercise in comparative analysis uh, and uh, draw conclusions uh, and uh, uh, present uh, this uh, as a paper or a presentation uh, to the audience. Uh, what's more, we are also seeking to um, do it in an interactive way. And uh, 
our students do have uh, um, good knowledge in the sphere of history, but uh, uh, on the basis of that knowledge, uh, we encourage them uh, to make their own conclusions. And uh, we um, ask uh, students to draw a comparison to exemplify uh, ideas uh, and uh, uh, the initial steps, uh, uh, although we are at the initial stage, it's only a second stage a year of uh, our uh, implementation, but uh, we rely on the students' prior knowledge uh, their foreign language uh, competence uh, and uh, uh, on the individual abilities uh, of each student. Thank you, Yelena Yurina. Thank you very much. Uh, we look forward to further reports on uh, your successes. Uh, and it's time for us to move on to the next paper, uh, which is uh, by Anna Toropova, who is a GIMO colleague. And um, uh, this deals uh, with the uh, anthropological uh, issues, uh, in essence. Uh, we'll deal with uh, channels uh, for the demonstration and perception of information and uh, uh, their application to our teaching needs. Uh, Anna, um, you're welcome. I'll, uh, try to get my slides on the screen. Um, thank you. Just a minute. Thank you for the ability, for the possibility to make a presentation. It's four types of channels of demonstration and reception, such as visualization, audioization, uh, kinesthesia, and uh, discretization. And uh, all this uh, is linked to the uh, rate of uh, transformation, transfer, and perception by the learner. There's a whole range of uh, aspects involved here. And uh, it is particularly important today because the recipient uh, must know how to single out uh, the most important information categorize it, but uh, in addition today when uh, we are facing or dealing with uh, numerous technological innovations, uh, this uh, is uh, important as never before. Uh, the learner must uh, master uh, such uh, competences as perception uh, and processing and uh, here we are focused on four uh, channels uh, of um, um, perception of information, visual, audio, kinesthetic, and uh, discrete. Uh, visualization, audioization are particularly important. However, we'll try to touch upon um, three and four in the uh, Today, um, more and, uh, modern um, curricula um, take account uh, of the recent achievements and discoveries uh, in uh, uh, such phenomenon as transfer information. In uh, this technological world, uh, when uh, retention of information uh, may be somewhat uh, problematic uh, due to a great amount uh, of the information uh, that we are exposed to. And uh, here, um, we may say of the uh, interaction of such um, disciplines in uh, pedagogy, biology, and uh, others, uh, but 
uh, one of the four channels uh, of uh, information reception uh, uh, may acquire a predominant uh, importance and uh, the information should always adapt uh, um, based uh, on the prior knowledge of the learner. One of the most uh, best known uh, models uh, is that of Frederick uh, Bester, who in 1975, uh, in one of his studies, he described uh, four different uh, methods of teaching depending on uh, the um, type of perception. Uh, there's someone who uh, mostly relies on visual perception uh, as distinct from those uh, who uh, perceive information through the audio or there are some who rely on uh, the analysis uh, of mathematical uh, uh, approaches. Uh, this is uh, the most rare of types uh, of all. Uh, and the, those uh, who uh, perceive the uh, surrounding um, well, there through visual reception there are those who rely on what they see. They quickly retain the color, shape, and the size. Uh, um, as uh, children, such people like drawing. They, as to the audio perception, that mostly relies uh, on uh, the sound. Uh, and uh, those uh, who tend to be uh, to belong to this uh, type, they like uh, to listen to music, to uh, audio books, and I will uh, dwell in brief uh, on each of these channels because uh, there are. Okay. So we uh, get acquainted uh, with the world uh, thanks to the motoric movements, uh, and uh, that's typical for children. When we work here, we must take into account how complicated it is for the students. Kinesthetics consists of the words which describe feelings, and you can see it also on the slide. There are only, uh, and only several years or decades ago, uh, scientists decided that there is another fourth group of people with a peculiar view of uh, the world, the discrete people. For them, they receive information through logical assessment with the uh, help of numbers. They look for logics in everything, for logic in everything. They build schemes and chains of events. If an individual usually can develop various senses for the discrete person, this is uh, not given, no? not typical. In the next two slides, you can also get acquainted with the major information on the subject and the reception of information through different channels. And the specific uh, functioning of uh, the uh, brain is described by many, uh, uh, by, 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 by many scientists and uh, myrmecologist Resnikova studied uh, the behavior of the ants. And uh, the behavior of the ants uh, using various uh, calculation degree uh, methods, and also the possibility how the ants can very fast assess the situation. What I mean is that uh, switching from one channel to another in the human brain uh, can be quite fast. If uh, we compare uh, with the work of the human brain, it is correct to say that the human brain can accumulate uh, large volumes of information and switch from one perception channel to another perception channel. This is uh, argued uh, by the well-known professor uh, of uh, Petersburg University, Tatiana Chernigovskaya. Besides, uh, there is also a supposition of the spectral nature of human perception. It is supported uh, by the a well-known phenomenon, uh, synesthesia. 
I am a, a teacher of the Greek language, and therefore all the terms which uh, have been used so far originate in the Greek language. Synesthesia is a connection with movement and uh, the involvement of several uh, of several senses. Synesthesia is uh, the phenomenon of perception uh, when uh, uh, different signals and senses uh, are mixed together or uh, they uh, form one single entity. So here you can see the example of the synesthesia when uh, different uh, phenomena or senses in the brain of a synesthesian are uh, shown in different uh, uh, in different uh, colors, and uh, this is uh, the fifth category of uh, individuals. The, the fifth type of uh, perception, perception of information. In this slide, you can see examples of, of the of synesthesia information when every uh, every uh, letter can uh, 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 a color can be assigned to every letter or to every figure then you uh, there is a small drawing here can you hear the colors a special sound for a, for each sound and also for the following uh, exercise to the audience uh, this is a generalizing exercise for all five types of uh, perception channels channels of perceiving information. This is a picture where you're supposed to call a color. So when you see the color, you must read the word. So if you if you are interested, try to do it. And uh, uh, this will not be as easy as it looks at first glance. Another example of the synthetic approach or perception of the, uh, of the world are these pictures. I see the sound for uh, major and it is yellow or uh, Kirkorov's uh, song. The color of the mood is blue. And in the last uh, slide, I want to describe how to, uh, to form, how to form language learning, taking into account these different groups. So uh, for a kinesthetic type, uh, you can use a ball for questions and answers and uh, to uh, organize your vocabulary dict uh, dictations uh, in this word or some other uh, exercise. So for the visual group, you can suggest uh, the, the introduction of the new material with the help of uh, a very graphic demonstration. Uh, for another group, uh, you can show demonstration materials with the possibility of passing them to the audience for, uh, for, for them to touch, like for example, examples of fruit or vegetables, and then you can have a whole uh, maybe store of such subjects, uh, or objects rather. And also we can introduce here articulation gymnastics using TV and the radio broadcasts and so on. Now with accent on uh, discrete, uh, so in this approach, you can use various schemes, various conundrums, various tasks, uh, suggesting to calculate uh, how to solve this or that problem. So for audience, uh, besides uh, uh, or listening, we can also suggest uh, listening to songs, to lectures, like there is a resource uh, TED, uh, also various uh, radio broadcasts, uh, and also uh, pronouncing some uh, vocabulary, uh, organizing uh, dictations and uh, summaries. Для синестетиков можно предложить. For synesthetics, we can suggest uh, uh, inventing some original slogan or uh, approach to some uh, explanation. Uh, can build a scheme or a table. And uh, it can also very well include uh, grammatical material, which is introduced uh, in the form of tables. And uh, the last phrase, the best uh, version is uh, to combine different channels of perception. So 
as to uh, involve various channels for uh, the learning process. Uh, thank you. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Dear colleagues, you are welcome with your questions. This subject usually gives rise to many questions and comments. If you have them, you're welcome. I have a question. Thank you for your presentation. And uh, can you please uh, uh, give your point of view? You said that there are different ways of uh, offering material to various groups. In uh, the conditions of the online format, it's much more difficult uh, to present information to different uh, uh, categories of people. So how do you cope with this problem in this, in this uh, environment? Thank you for your question. I conducted uh, my own uh, kind of implicit uh, survey or research because uh, um, we worked online for a long time. And uh, get, uh, students fell into two categories, those who were awfully tired from online uh, learning and wanted to go back uh, to the classroom. And there were those who liked everything, their performance became better. And uh, uh, the attendance, the attendance improved. Uh, they became more diligent. So for them, uh, online education was to their benefit. And uh, when uh, we try to find uh, the connection between various uh, perception channels, um, I would say that uh, online education was, was better for audio uh, groups and visual groups. And uh, for kinesthetics, it was diff more difficult. Uh, for us, to the, for discretionists, uh, uh, they were in a neutral position. The introverts, uh, therefore, uh, they find, uh, they find uh, benefits in any environment. But those people who cannot touch something, cannot move with something together with their fellow students, for them, it was quite complicated. That's the way I see the present environment. Thank you. Only one comment, which is important in the pedagogical framework, that individuals do not remain in one essential um, field. Um, people change with age and people need more sense channels as they develop. And some problems in education uh, are related to the fact that child find it difficult to switch from channel to channel. So there is some uh, dynamics and development in this sphere. Thank you for your presentation. And we'll continue with the discussion of multisensory issues in, in classes of, of foreign languages, of which uh, Alessia Kunitsina and Anna Martinova are going to present in their uh, statement from the Moscow State Linguistic University. Multimodal text is an element of a modern foreign language lesson. Multimodal text. Dear colleagues, so switching, switching on the demonstration. So the subject of our uh, presentation is a multimodal text as an element of a modern foreign language lesson. This is a very topical issue, building, uh, a, a constructing or planning a lesson with the help of multimedia. And here we are supposed not only to know our own subject, but to know new uh, technologies that change our methods all the time. Modern students prefer interactive education and atmosphere of cooperation. And uh, that requires change of methods of education. Together with my colleague, we discuss quite often uh, how to build, uh, how to construct a class effectively. We decided to survey uh, the students of our university. We wanted to get some feedback from them and understand uh, what materials are better for perception and for learning, what makes understanding uh, easier and uh, to remember things. And my colleague is going to present the results of our survey. But first, I would like to focus on some theoretical issues which we uh, relied upon. 
So in the framework of the competence and approach, the main purpose of education is developing communicative competences. We want to teach students to use their knowledge in real life and communicate in real situations of communication. We actively use the, such elements as uh, multi multimedia uh, presentations, uh, methods of, uh, of uh, modeling uh, various situations, uh, business games, debates, uh, mapping, uh, flip classrooms. Many of them have been in place for a long time. Some of them are new. And to implement most of these methods, what is needed is using the multimodal text. And we look at it as a didactic means of identifying the education process. Here on this slide, you see the definition that we used in our research. I think everyone is familiar with it. And as to the text, we understand here slogans, scheme tables, pictures, uh, and, uh, and other illustrations. And the special and the dynamic uh, multimodal texts, they are of greater interest, uh, such as. Uh, video films, uh, professional video files, uh, and uh, working with multimodal uh, text, uh, we uh, include uh, various stages. First, uh, the preparatory, uh, preparatory stages, uh, then the presentation of the material, remembering the information, and adapting the uh, language uh, material. The, the following rules are very important. I'm also showing uh, them here. The text uh, must uh, from the point of view of content uh, must be in keeping with the subject matter of the, of the unit. Uh, the picture uh, should not have any additional subjects to distract students' attention uh, and uh, to cause additional emotions. So the teacher must uh, prepare uh, 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 some uh, exercises in advance to better understand uh, the multimodal uh, film. And in this way, the teacher must be able to create uh, contacts of cooperation with the students. We also rely on the fact that the multimodal text realizes the principle of visual, visuality, and uh, this principle is uh, analyzed by many researchers in psychology and pedagogics. And the researchers prove that the information is received much better if it is uh, offered through various channels. We have just heard, uh, listened to a presentation on the same subject. I also think that we all notice uh, how students' t uh, teaching changes uh, when uh, they jump from one text to another. They cannot uh, read the same text for a long time because this is now their present habit. They are accustomed uh, to this change of information. They are accustomed to communicating in various groups, use uh, various uh, contacts, so they look through the text and not focus on it. So multimodal text and the visual component here must have a positive impact on the concentration of students, concentration on the subject or the text. We also believe that a multimodal text is an emotive element and a very positive motivation and emotion. Uh, involvement can compensate uh, for lack of uh, lack of abilities sometimes. So this can help to developing uh, memory and perception and uh, pupils can acquire more self-confidence and uh, our work in this way will be more efficient. So to prove uh, that uh, this is an effective means uh, of teaching and uh, we conducted a survey and my colleague is going to report the results of the survey. Good afternoon, so I continue. In this slide, you see the questionnaire which was offered to our students. 60 students participated from different years, and this survey was meant to identify how uh, students uh, assess the use of various uh, multimodal texts, both in class and uh, when they prepare for classes. So how it all influences on ability to understand the information to work in class and the problems associated with this. So in this uh, slide, we see the uh, a graph built depending on the results of the uh, student survey. So the analysis shows here that uh, the greatest difficulty 
arrows uh, with uh, uh, listening or audio text. We don't see here the, uh, the percentage, but you can see the colors. You can see the colors. So 70% of the those surveyed said that with listening, it was difficult to understand. And the elements here are important. 56% identified speed as the stumbling block for understanding listening. That proves our impression that the most, uh, most important is how uh, thoroughly uh, the material has been selected. You also can see here that uh, the visual component uh, makes the text easier to understand. Then comes the printed text, text with the pictures. And if there is a visual component, again, it's easier to understand. The same effect we see when we compare visual text and audio text. It's easier for them to understand the text if there is some video uh, component. And this graph shows to us the uh, questions, uh, ask, answer to the question about the interest uh, of the students, depending on the type. So we see here 43% have chosen video text as uh, the most efficient. And as to the standard text, the printed text remains uh, quite high. So in the table, you see how uh, the uh, assessment of very interesting grows here. Most students prefer text with parallel visualization, 76% of those surveyed. That confirms our impression that uh, multiple, uh, multimodal text should be used in teaching foreign languages. Knowing how important it is to keep the attention of modern students, especially in our legal department, we wanted to know the impression on, uh, about how illustrations help uh, concentration and interest. And uh, here, uh, one means no influence, five means very good influence. Um, this uh, confirms uh, the need for the use of such texts uh, in the classroom. And uh, uh, this uh, uh, refers to uh, content uh, in uh, the selection of the presented material should be of particular importance. And uh, as to the audio presentation, it should be about three minutes uh, long. As to another graph, uh, it illustrates the type uh, of uh, texts uh, presented for homework. It's uh, mostly the uh, printed text uh, rather than uh, video or audio. But we are not satisfied uh, with this low percentage uh, of uh, uh, audio and visual presentation uh, as homework. We need uh, to consistently practice uh, the uh, listening ability. And uh, around 80% of the respondents uh, agree that uh, uh, the use uh, of audiovisual illustration facilitates the retention of the material uh, and uh, improves their pronunciation as well as uh, gives them uh, an uh, insight into the existing situation in the um, uh, foreign countries. Uh, so the above uh, leads us to the conclusion that um, it is uh, important to use dynamic multimodal texts uh, as a means of uh, causing motivation and efficiency. Thank you. Thank you for your attention. Um, colleague, colleagues, do we have questions here at this point? Um, that was uh, most uh, interesting um, aspect uh, of uh, multi-sensory perception. Maybe you want to make a comment uh, or uh, ask a question. Then, uh, thank you, thank you very much. Why don't we pick up uh, on the previous topic and uh, look at the individual strategies uh, that uh, 
a learner may employ uh, uh, in learning a foreign language. And we are inviting Anna Ramenko and Olga Matveva from the Lomonosov Moscow State University. Good afternoon, colleagues. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank the organizers uh, for the interesting papers uh, presented so far. Uh, we were um, interested uh, in following the latest uh, developments uh, uh, concerning research uh, and uh, practical studies uh, in this field. And uh, what we would like to focus on today is the interdisciplinary component. Uh, my colleague uh, is a teacher of English uh, and uh, uh, she will contribute to, uh, to this, uh, uh, particularly based on her experience of teaching uh, professionals uh, of uh, various kinds of interests. But let me start uh, uh, with an outline of what we are going to focus on. And uh, one is uh, digitalization that's been touched upon uh, somewhat. Uh, and then uh, we will also focus uh, on uh, theoretical um, issues. Uh, my colleague will uh, speak on the uh, augmented reality and um, um, will exemplify that with formats uh, and individualized uh, achievements we won't uh, dwell uh, on more issues in greater detail uh, those that have already been covered but uh, as i uh, looked at the program uh, i saw we expect uh, uh, more papers uh, on those topics but we'll rather focus on the individual learning path. Speaking of digitalization of education in general, I've been involved in that area and um, uh, for some uh, 10 years or more. And uh, I have a PhD in uh, that um, uh, discipline and uh, uh, before this uh, distant uh, learning situation emerged, uh, I conducted uh, a questionnaire and uh, among those uh, who are part of the Generation Z or Generation Z, and uh, I was uh, happy to see that uh, uh, thinking and uh, um, emerged uh, among the answers more often than gadgets. Uh, I was uh, pleased to see that, but uh, uh, we should look at the technology as a means to increase uh, motivation. And uh, when uh, we talk of the so-called uh, clip thinking, uh, which is uh, a feature of uh, today's um, mode of thinking. We, uh, within uh, the framework of our seminar, should focus on the different uh, methods and technologies uh, of uh, language teaching and maybe look at the advantages uh, um, this kind of new uh, technology uh, in education can uh, uh, afford and uh, what could be more useful for those uh, students uh, who are somewhat lagging behind uh, as to the uh, more advanced students uh, according to our findings uh, we see that uh, the upside there, down class, uh, reverted class, so to say, um, is uh, seen uh, um, as most um, convenient for advanced students. And uh, with uh, my 
10 years of uh, the experience uh, of studying technologies for the purposes uh, of uh, teaching, I believe that uh, uh, it is uh, our task uh, to uh, rely on technology to make it uh, a useful tool rather than a hindrance. Uh, and uh, uh, technologies uh, uh, may, uh, on the one hand, uh, uh, replace uh, traditional methods, but uh, what's more, transform the teaching process uh, or educational process uh, as a whole. And, uh, much has been uh, mentioned uh, uh, already, but uh, we want to dwell uh, on it in greater detail. It's uh, obvious when uh, we are talking at uh, an individual approach to a particular group uh, of learners uh, uh, or student-centered uh, um, course design, um, we should uh, keep in mind uh, the uh, objectives of teaching and um, seek to uh, develop uh, students' potential. And today, uh, we could uh, single out two basic approaches to uh, shaping these um, personal learning parts uh, and uh, we want to see where we are at the moment and uh, what our target may be and uh, the first uh, stage as an approach could be that of individualization where all students may have one um, design their target in mind but the role of the teacher in that situation uh, is uh, the most uh, uh, dominant, is that of the leader and um, of the mentor. But uh, the next stage uh, would be personalizing uh, the learning path uh, with the um, overall outcome being uh, the same for all students, but uh, with variations as to the materials to be offered to particular uh, students uh, in view of their uh, personal uh, motivation and uh, uh, there's uh, uh, some kind of research undertaken uh, into um, the types of texts that could be uh, presented there for the purpose uh, of uh, discussing uh, one particular topic, but um, um, with uh, reliance on different types of texts and uh, within the framework uh, of a classroom, four such texts uh, were um, presented there and those texts were adapted to a particular level of proficiency in uh, having read uh, each uh, their own uh, text. Uh, the students uh, were able to conduct uh, a very successful debate. And nonetheless, the teacher uh, still uh, uh, retains uh, the role of the leader and mentor and um, the role of uh, um, the guiding mediator, but uh, within uh, individualized classes, uh, we are moving on to the third stage, that of uh, a personalized learning path, uh, which again, encourages uh, students to uh, seek to continue education uh, and follow their chosen path uh, and goal as uh, their overall uh, target. 
and uh, that mostly refers to the so-called informal education when uh, 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 each and every one in the society is uh, uh, using um, the um, world web, uh, uh, the internet uh, through mobile applications could uh, achieve self-development and uh, self-education and uh, that uh, is uh, necessary for professionals for the development. Uh, some uh, of the universities uh, uh, are better positions to use uh, um, these uh, approaches in uh, their training of um, graduates uh, who seek to be uh, more employable and uh, competitive in the labor market. Uh, with this, I would like to invite my uh, colleague, uh, Olga Matveyeva, but let me uh, say first about uh, what's going on in the Moscow University, Linguistic University, or Lomonosov University. Uh, we have um, a number of courses uh, based on personal learning path approach. Uh, mostly in uh, interdisciplinary master's uh, programs uh, with a particular focus uh, in, uh, in the disciplinary approach, both in uh, undergraduate and graduate students, uh, as well as uh, professional development of tutors. Uh, and uh, this is something we are um, doing as uh, our uh, new program. I would like to. Um, good afternoon, colleagues. This, for uh, we are um, talking about the. Uh, advantages uh, of this augmented reality. Let me say a couple of words on the technology itself. Uh, it presumes uh, uh, blending of computer uh, generated information with the environment uh, through interaction uh, with uh, uh, virtual 3D uh, objects uh, while uh, maintaining the connection with the real world. And uh, one of the advantages uh, is a 3D visualization um, enabling the use of um, new technology which is both in uh, teaching sciences uh, and uh, this uh, could be uh, and has been uh, proven as efficient uh, and effective for foreign language teaching. Uh, let me dwell in brief uh, on additional reality applications, uh, which are increased uh, uh, motivation uh, with a uh, view to one's uh, world perception, interests, and the level of foreign language uh, proficiency, while also taking into account the individual psychological characteristics of a learner and uh, we can uh, uh, look at uh, the specific applications uh, and the tasks just a couple of words on communicative strategies uh, our assignments uh, sought to develop uh, the strategy of interaction, uh, reception, production and mediation. And um, the, we have uh, selected several uh, skills uh, uh, for a diagnosis uh, to um, see 
uh, how students uh, have mastered their, the skill of uh, asking to clarify, uh, to um, ask to paraphrase, uh, to join their, a discussion if they need to do that, or maybe readdress. Uh, or um, redirect uh, the um, speaker to the initial question and uh, uh, he will rely on uh, um, augmented reality uh, which um, um, gives the opportunity to uh, follow uh, a sequence uh, while at the same time uh, um, record uh, um, a comment uh, and uh, use it uh, later on um, and so on. One uh, uh, situation is that uh, of, uh, you see here a screenshot uh, of a metaverse uh, application. And uh, at the last uh, stage uh, of work, uh, learners uh, are invited uh, to uh, upload their, their uh, answer and share it uh, with our students and teachers. Uh, this is one of the uh, tasks uh, in uh, a block of tasks, uh, and uh, this could be adapted uh, to a particular level of uh, uh, language uh, proficiency. Stage by stage. It could be uh, supplemented with uh, screens uh, and uh, windows for uh, possible questions that students may have. Uh, and uh, a student uh, has the opportunity of uh, writing and rewriting, re listening and uh, um, listening more than once uh, and then uh, um, to reach the kind of level that is uh, satisfactory. Uh, the objects of uh, the global culture and heritage in different languages. And I think that uh, foreign language teachers can find much of interest here. And uh, we offered to the students virtual excursions, and the students were supposed to choose uh, the uh, site of interest and uh, share co host uh, their screens, organize excursions. And uh, his fellow students were supposed to interrupt him, ask additional questions. And they were supposed to make sure that they understood his excursion, paraphrase what he has suggested, and then using this application in the framework of building an individual trajectory, the students received a chance to select their own material to show their own abilities. the impressions of the students with the work of this application. And uh, if there were some difficult moments, uh, the, pro the application itself was received with great enthusiasm by the students. Thank you for your presentation. Well, unfortunately, you exceeded your time limit. It was only one report, not two. But we received the uh, information about what you have been doing. We do not have time for questions. And now we move to the next presentation. Anna Alexandrovna from the State, St. Petersburg State University. And then my favorite subject on the European framework of reference as a tool for designing examination tasks for students of international relations. I also want to 
thank everyone for very interesting reports. I'm glad to continue the work of our uh, section. I would like to share with you our experience of elaborating tasks for the state exam, especially in specifically in the reading section. And then I work in the Department of Foreign Languages in the field of international relations. In the Department of State of Foreign uh, uh, International Relations, uh, we'll have the state examination for the first time in a decade, uh, that's the restoration of a long forgotten practice. And then during this decade, the university did not stand still and uh, moved towards uh, closer towards uh, the European educational environment. Now in uh, our university, students uh, are supposed to take the examination, first at the level of B1, and then uh, by all means B2. As to the Department of International Relations, so that happens after the first year, because students come or well prepared or after the second year. And I would like to note here that the exam designed here for the B2 level uh, passed uh, international uh, examination and it confirmed that it's in keeping with the international uh, standards and uh, the Council of Europe uses this as an illustration of this examination. And uh, we uh, try to support the tendency of integrating into the global education environment and in designing our state examination we also relied on the um, European scale of competencies. I will show in my presentation what sources we used in designing the uh, tasks uh, for the reading aspect. First of all, in designing the state examination, we were supposed to answer the question what level of scale would accept as the starting point and as our direction. And I, I dealt with reading, so I can be quite confident, uh, saying that we decided C1 was our objective, first of all, depending on the number of hours, which we had contact hours, which we had after the students passed their B1 examination, uh, they received 250 contact hours of English and taking into account uh, their home assignments, so that's over 300 hours and if uh, they passed B, B2 after the first, after the second, um, uh, the, the second year. And uh, reading as an aspect for our English classes is one of our leading aspects. Uh, students read articles, discuss them, analyze them. So we decided that here, we, our objective should be C1. So the question arose what it meant for us what it involved. Uh, here I show the sources, uh, uh, sources of reference. So first of all, uh, the, the scale itself, companion volume of 2018, so there is also an issue of 2020, then uh, uh, tasks, assignments from the certificate in advanced English and criteria, which I'm going to elaborate later on, um, elaborated by Kirsch. So the first element we analyzed was the general characteristic of competencies in the field of reading. So reading for information and argument. At the level of C1. So I show in blue what was added in 2018. But I consulted the issue of 2020. It remained in the new issue. Uh, this is uh, uh, the competence which is described here in blue. You can read it yourselves. What was important for us here? What was important was uh, that at the state examination we can offer a rather long uh, three or uh, four thousand uh, symbols articles on professional subjects because the state examination is state is uh, taken by the students in the field uh, in the field of their profession. And uh, we can also test uh, their uh, reading competencies at the level of uh, implications and what was this what is described implicitly in the text. 
Further on, we analyze the communicative foreign language competence, competencies, those of them which uh, relate to the professional competencies and they're shown here on this slide. You can again read them on your own. What was important for us here? That uh, test questions could be directed at uh, testing understanding of such texts as uh, idiomatic expressions, uh, registers, uh, emotional connotation, humor, cultural context, then modality. For example, modal verbs, which are used to express degrees of certainty or probability. Now we can also test strategic competencies of our students, such as uh, the skill of language guess, context guess. So we are not supposed to design our questions only at what is explicitly mentioned in the text, but also test how they are infer from the text. So we, uh, that's why we design our texts. So we uh, decided on the types of the, of the texts, what competencies to test, but also uh, we want to be more concrete, specific. So we decided to compare the questions which we elaborated with the uh, questions to the reading of some international examination, which is uh, uh, used in this, at this level. At the level of the Council of Europe, uh, there are examples from the uh, from the exam certificate in advanced English. But one must note here that uh, the tasks in our examination and in that exam were different because uh, for the European exam it's only 45 minutes for reading, and the tasks vary. And uh, we decided that. <clears throat> we should focus on the format true false. And we had uh, three questions like this to every text. <clears throat> uh, uh, the, the closest format is multiple choice because it involves the same uh, brain uh, operations and it's important uh, for the correct answer to identify the main idea and uh, then see what the paraphrased uh, sentences referred to. So that's why we decided on uh, the multiple choice questions. But uh, as, to, as to comparing, it's not always easy. So we have chosen the following criteria uh, suggested by Erwin uh, Kirsch. I, I translated them into Russian and they used in the international program for assessing uh, the uh, success of students uh, by the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development. Now we will focus on this criteria in detail and I will show how we compare the, the assignments. The first criteria is the strategy of answering questions. Erwin Kirsch identifies four strategies and they are given here uh, on the basis of growing complexity. So the first one is locating, and uh, here you are supposed to find the relevant information in the text. And uh, in this slide, I want to show the strategy. This is part of the assignment from CEE. And you see here the question, uh, which presupposes four answers, and only one of them is correct. And if we look at the green mark, mark at the end of the uh, text, I write that uh, this is uh, uh, an assessment of a restaurant. And uh, we have uh, to here to uh, uh, identify the most important uh, uh, parameter. And uh, the green one shows low, low prices. So to prove it, uh, we have to find in the text something identical or synonymous. And we see in the text also indicated in the green, which says the prices are not cheap. So we here see a, a synonyms low and cheap. This is a, a simple strategy. More complicated, which is called the cycling. It's uh, similar to locating, but here to uh, find uh, several answers in the text to one question. Slide. 
А в данном случае то, что вы делаете... Now we'll go back to the same slide, what is shown here in blue. I think this is cycling. Because we must find the correlation between friendly owner for the restaurant with a fragment of the text which supports this theory. But we do not have here either synonym for friendly or the word friendly itself or the word owner. So the prompts here in the text will be the phrases in blue. For example, charming proprietor. But charming and friendly are not quite synonyms. But if we uh, keep on reading, then uh, by, you know, by bringing together all these fragments, we can answer the question that yes, uh, the owner of the restaurant was uh, very friendly. Also want to draw your attention to the fact that uh, there is a synonym for friendly affability, but uh, the examinees are not supposed to know it because uh, uh, it belongs to the C2 level. So you can only figure it out, figure out its meaning from the context. So this is cycling. Now the next stage is the uh, integrating stage. Here we're supposed to find correlation between different uh, uh, abstracts from the text in accordance with uh, questions. So it can be a certain type of relationship, uh, similarity, differences, degree of expression of some uh, uh, quality, so the causal relationship. This kind of strategy is included into the question uh, which we offer at the state examination, our future state examination. Again, I will explain now what the assignment is aimed at. Uh, the students receive an article, uh, original article, authentic article from the Guardian newspaper. It is uh, quite fresh and it deals with the protests in the Netherlands uh, aimed at restrictions connected with the uh, pandemic. And uh, the article suggests that one of the reasons is the vaccination delay. Students are supposed to answer the question whether it's true or false that the protests in the Netherlands could be uh, avoided if uh, the vaccination campaign uh, had started earlier. So it was a causal relationship which is supposed to be identified. So in order to agree or to disagree with this statement, a student is supposed first to answer all of the parts of the text which somehow refer to protests, all, all those elements which refer to the reasons, and uh, then analyze uh, this information, bring it together, and uh, then... Sorry, there is some interference. And uh, the most complicated strategy, I don't have an example, for it generating when Well, it's important to, to correlate different parts of the text, but the criteria must be chosen by the student independently. <clears throat> so this is the first criteria, answering questions. Now let's proceed. <clears throat> we can also compare how complex are assignments in different examinations using the criteria of the conditions of processing information. So first of all, how many phrases are there in the question? If we look at the CE, we see that only one interrogative question and several short phrases for the answer. Now, this uh, question in the state exam, we see that there is one long uh, compound sentence. <clears throat> but uh, they both more or less coincide uh, as to the complexity. Now, the number of the questions in both uh, assignments, it's only one uh, answer which is expected. And second uh, is, uh, um, in the conclusions uh, uh, in answering the question. So if we look at the CAE assignment, then we see that for 50% of the hypotheses, we must, uh, a student must make his own conclusion because uh, there are no uh, identical answers or, or, or similar answers in the text. That's what I have described, what was mentioned in blue. 
And another a task was to understand whether the decor was attractive. Decor was uh, an important feature for the restaurant. I apologize because I have to interrupt you because you have exhausted your time limit. I will only show one slide which suggests that in four criteria we have found a balance. Thank you. Thank you. A very interesting presentation. Probably we should discuss it, but unfortunately, because of the time limit, we cannot do that. And now we move to our foreign guests, international guests, and the next about the theory of translinguism in fulfilling the reading assignments. So we stop, we remain with the reading problem in foreign languages. So this also a presentation from our Turkish colleagues from the University of Chekorova, Ilhan Berka and Dr. Young Askan. Thank you very much. You're welcome. First of all, I want to express my happiness to be with you today. Um, and I will share my slides. You can see it, right? Any problems with this? Yes. Okay. So uh, I am a lecturer at Alanya Alaaddin Teykubat University and a PhD candidate at the same time. And I'm writing my PhD dissertation on translingual, uh, the effects of translanguaging pedagogy on receptive skills, listening and reading. And this is a part of our pilot study uh, for reading texts. And, uh, you know, uh, the long held belief that only the target language must be used in a language classroom has been challenged by the weave of dynamic bilingualism in recent years. And translanguaging is the enactment of this dynamic bilingualism. You know, people use all their language repertoires and semiotic resources for more effective communication or better learning in this view. And these are the primary studies by Garcia in 2009 and Garcia and Way in 2014. And uh, the problem with our field is that since the uh, 2010, uh, the topic has been studied in English as second language teaching ESL contexts with multilingual students for mainstream education. Uh, you know, it has been studied for teaching uh, different subject classes to multilingual students. But we were cu curious if uh, we could apply uh, the premises of uh, this pedagogy into EFL context for receptive skills. And the trans translanguaging lens for teaching English in the EFL context could provide a promising path to dismantle English as a monolithic entity, native speakerism as a pervasive ideology, and English only as a pedagogical orientation. And this uh, reference is from one of the latest studies by Tian uh, and others. In such a language class with translanguaging pedagogy, language learners are not considered non-natives lacking English proficiency, but resourceful individuals with multilingual repertoires and abilities. And in such a class, they can use all their uh, language repertoires together, and it brings a new in, uh, sight to language teaching in all of the contexts. Students are to bring all their linguistic resources as strategic tools for efficient learning in academic tasks, and receiving some input in one language and producing an output in the other uh, is a frequent translanguaging activity used by the pedagogical, by pedagogical practice. And Williams uh, wrote for you know pedagogical pedagogical translanguaging for the first time in two, uh, 1994. And this uh, the study uh, he studied the effects of uh, you know receiving an input uh, in. Uh, one of the native languages in class and producing an output in the target language. And uh, this was the first study of uh, translanguage, uh, translanguage and pedagogy, actually. And uh, this is our argument here in our thesis, in our study. The language repertoire of multilinguals is single and fed from the central engine. And therefore, multilinguals move between monolingual and bilingual modes in their daily lives as the situation requires, and they naturally mix all their languages. 
And to design authentic language teaching and learning situations, native language can be integrated into uh, second language teaching programs by considering the most methodol methodological particularity, practicality, and possibility dimensions. You know, because the native language is an ecological feature of the contexts and affects the complex process of language learning and acquisition. So this is our main argument in our study. Uh, and these are the main studies that uh, are the theoretical background, that form the theoretical background for uh, our study in translanguaging. And in this uh, pilot study, we aim to contribute to field by designing a reading task in an EFL context by translanguaging pedagogy. The learners are allowed to use all their linguistic resources by providing them translingual breaks to use any language they want. It can be target language, native language, or the language they are comfortable with. You know, if there are two or three uh, Russian students, they, they can be pairs and they can use uh, in Russian for a limited time for the reading task. And whether activating learners' linguistic repertoire affects uh, reading comprehension or not has been studied. And we had two research questions. What's the effect of translanguaging pedagogy on reading comprehension? And what are students' ideas about the translingual reading task? Uh, it's a quasi-experimental study, and we used both qualitative and quantitative data here. Uh, we compared uh, the comprehension scores that students in the experimental and contro control groups got uh, through SPSS. And their ideas about translingual reading tasks were co collected through semi-structured open-ended questionnaires. Uh, and these questionnaires were both for the control group and uh, the experimental group. Also, as a uh, teacher researcher, I kept uh, a diary about uh, our practice. And the participants, the study was conducted at one of the state universities in Turkey, Alanya Alaaddin Keikobat University, at English preparation program. The participants were 43 intermediate level uh, learners, and 23 of the students were in the experimental group, whereas 20 students were in the uh, control group. Actually, we chose them uh, with convenience sampling because uh, I uh, had to teach them. So these were my classes, my two classes. The control group students did the task with a monolingual approach that is using only the target language. But in the experimental group, uh, the task was planned with a translanguaging pedagogy. Uh, I want to tell how uh, we uh, designed the task with this pedagogy. Uh, we read about uh, the translingual guide by Selig and Seltzer in 2013. And uh, we designed uh, a task by following their suggestions. The text was an intermediate level uh, English text uh, titled Getting Away From It All. It had three paragraphs and it discussed the issues related to traveling abroad. And it was really interesting for students. You know, they like uh, traveling abroad. The task was designed in three stages, uh, like preview, view, and review, as uh, suggested by Freeman. And in preview, uh, we wrote, uh, actually, I wrote an anticipation guide on the board. So the statement was, you should travel abroad if you want to have a good travel experience. And I provided, I gave uh, students three minutes for translingual discussion on whether they agree or not. So they could discuss with their friends in their native languages here. You know, in Turkey, we have uh, some students from, uh, Eastern countries, and but most of them are Turkish students, so most of them uh, did the activity in Turkish. But uh, in the experimental group, there were two uh, Arabic students, and they were uh, made a pair together, and they spoke in Arabic. But the whole class discussion uh, was in English, of course, and I gave uh, them only three minutes for this discussion, a translingual discussion. And in Weave, uh, reading allowed the three paragraphs with translingual breaks. Uh, after each paragraph, a translingual break for three minutes was provided, this time to let students to summarize what they read, discuss unknown vocabulary, and annotate the main points of the paragraph that uh, they read. And after reading the whole text finished, five minutes were provided to answer uh, the comprehension questions. They, again, uh, here, they could discuss with their partners in their native languages. They could translate the comprehension questions uh, to understand uh, them better. 
And in review section, a translingual break for three minutes was provided again to let students discuss summaries for the whole text and write them in English. And all groups shared their summaries and the main idea of the text in English with the whole class. So here we had a whole class discussion only in the target language. I never use, I, I tried not to use, uh, you know, uh, our native language. I tried to use only English and the whole class activities were done always in English in my class. And the reading task with the control group, it was done as instructed in the teacher's guide in only English. So they uh, did the uh, preview, view and review activities again, and they were formed pairs again, but all the interactions were to be done only in English. And what are the findings? Uh, from my diary, the experimental group was more active in discussions, both in the native and the target language. So they were not only uh, active in the native language, after discussing in uh, the native language with their uh, partners, uh, they participated more uh, when they spoke in the target language too. And the biggest problem was ensuring real collaboration as some of the students did not contribute summaries or discussions and instead focused on something else uh, this was a problem with both groups uh, in the experimental group as they could use their native languages. Uh, they spoke about, sometimes they spoke about something else, but in the monolingual group, in the control group, uh, they were silent. They just tried to uh, do the activity on their own. And even if I told them to discuss with their partners about the vocabulary or the main points in the paragraph, they tried to do the task alone. And the learners in the control group yeah, attempted uh, to do the task individually. Although they were told to discuss the unclear sentences, uh, they uh, some pairs insisted on using the native language. So, uh, however, I tried, uh, however, I encouraged them uh, to speak only in the target language. They insisted on some pairs insisted on using the native language again and tried to find the meanings of the new vocabulary on their online dictionaries by looking at their smartphones. They didn't discuss about them. And the summaries that learners wrote with their partners were more detailed in the experimental group. And, but uh, the comprehension scores, when, when we compared the comprehension scores by SPSS, uh, actually there was not a statistically significant difference. As you can see in my tables here. Uh, we conducted a man with new test. Uh, the experimental group had a higher mean score uh, with a higher uh, median score, but there was not a statistically significant difference between the groups. And uh, this is open ended questionnaire for the control group. We asked them what difficulties did you have in the reading activity? And it's evident from here lack of vocabulary knowledge was the most common. We conducted a uh, qualitative analysis by following suggestions uh, by Brown and Clark, which is 2006. And as you see, uh, lack of vocabulary knowledge was the most common factor. No difficulties, you know, it was a problem. And these were related to uh, reading aloud. So it, it might be better uh, to let students read individually or with their partners rather than reading aloud. And need for translation, as you see, and prejudice for the text to be difficult and limited time for reading was stated once. What kind of effects do you think English only conversations with your friends in the reading activity had on reading comprehension? You know, uh, many of the students gave short answers here, like nice, it was good. Uh, and learning vocabulary was the other point, but they did not interact much about vocabulary. Necessity for comprehension, texts more fun and clear, was stated once. And negative effect, translation into Turkish is necessary, no need to translate back into English. So uh, this finding was with the control group, so the group that had to use only the target language. And, uh, you know, this is a need for translation in the first question and translation into Turkish necessary in the second question Question might indicate that a translanguaging approach might be preferred for reading tasks. And the others I talked about in the you know, uh, slide. 
And this was the open, uh, the results of the findings of the open-ended questionnaire for the experimental group. So we asked them, what do you think about the effect of translingual pair work on reading comprehension? Please describe. Uh, many of the positive answers were, again, without any reason. It was nice, you know, we enjoyed. But more comprehension by translanguaging was stated uh, by six students class time saver because they could talk about, you know, their partners about everything. Uh, translating key parts, more comprehension. And one of them said, uh, translating includes English and is, uh, you know, enjoyable. Uh, with a condition only for difficult parts, two students stated that, and helpful with collaborative partners. So uh, ensuring a real collaboration might be a problem in such classes. And what about negative answers? A rule to speak only English should be for more practice. Habit formation to use native language all the time. And these are, you know, um, the bodies of students. And better to paraphrase with simple vocabulary in the target language in grade. And negative without a reason was uh, from one student. And, you know, the, uh, some students uh, translating and uh, some students touched upon translating and claimed that it led to more comprehension, but some students prefer translanguaging when, when they had uh, difficulty comprehending. The negative answers indicated students' fear of habit formation to use the native language. So this was uh, one of the most common uh, findings. And judging from the comprehension scores, adopting a translanguaging pedagogy might not lead to statistically significant difference in reading comprehension, however, Adopting a translanguaging pedagogy might have helped students discuss reading text and vocabulary and participate in the task, both in their native languages and in the target language, because the students in the control group, uh, I'm sorry, experimental group, uh, participated more in both uh, their native languages and in the target language. So ensuring a real communication might be a problem with both groups. Some responses in the control group called for a translanguaging pedagogy. Although some students in the experimental group preferred using only English in classes, the control group was more passive and the experimental group interacted more in the target language after they first discussed it in their native languages. The summaries prepared by the experimental group was more detailed, however, writing the summaries took a long time. Uh, so it can be better uh, <clears throat> to uh, do this task orally without writing because it took really long time, like uh, 20 more minutes than the control group. And translingual discussions in the experimental group might have helped students discuss unknown vocabulary and enabled students to comprehend the text more. And these were uh, by Galante and Garcia and Way studies. And what about our conclusion here for our pilot study? Adopting a translanguage in pedagogy for reading tasks did not lead to statistically significant difference. However, it led them to participate more in the discussions and exploit the reading text to the full. Students' answers indicated that they might prefer translanguaging for better comprehension, and translating might help students comprehend the reading text more. Their biggest fear was for habit formation. However, when students were to use only target language, they were much more passive. Many of the students did not interact in the target language. And by translanguaging, they were active both in their native language and the target language. That might indicate that translanguaging might be an organic language practice occurring naturally and authentically in language classes. <laughs> Therefore, designing reading tasks with a translanguaging pedagogy might be sensible was our conclusion. Of course, we are still going on our study uh, and we are studying its effect on uh, listening comprehension as well. And Thank you very much for listening. If you have any questions or comments, I would appreciate them. Ну, даже если бы у нас были вопросы, спасибо вам большое за выступление. Мы, к сожалению, не сможем. We did have questions or comments. Uh, we are constrained for time and need to move on to our next presentation because uh, we um, will now ask um, our presenter to speak uh, on the upsurge of interest in foreign language 
teaching uh, during the pandemic. Uh, and uh, I'm inviting Douglas Ponton, uh, who on the one hand represents the uh, Russian University of uh, Friendship, and on the other hand, the University of uh, Catania, Italy. Uh, we are looking forward to your presentation. Hello? 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 Yes, yes, we can hear you. We can hear you. We can hear you. Thank you. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Can you hear us? Hello? No, you cannot. Can you hear us now? Can you hear us now? Uh, yes, we can hear you. We, we can hear you. Uh, I have here? Yes, we can. Happy to see you and your slides oh. too. Oh, okay. So if I if I can um, make it work like this, I have my telephone, my mobile on, and I'm I'm using the internet as well. So is that okay for you? Shall I shall I start? Yes, please. How long is it? Like fifteen minutes or something? I gather. Fifteen minutes. Okay. And Thank the limits are strict. Okay, that's Eva Bolshoi. Thank you, Irina. Um, and thank you very much for having me at this conference. I'm very happy to be here uh, talking to you today. Um, it's really, really interesting to be here. Thank you. Um, well, I'm going to be talking about um, the, some of the implications of um, the COVID situation uh, and the language classroom. So this is... Um, a question really that I suppose all of us have been um, faced with in the last uh, last year, that we're used to being educators, we're used to having contact, physical, not physical contact with, them, with our students, but actually face-to-face -face contact with our students. And we found that we've suddenly been able, we've been uh, forced to um, go online, to use online teaching. We, we don't really have uh, training. Uh, for this uh, necessarily. So I'm asking uh, in this, uh, the, last, uh, the last year since we've been all in lockdown, the pandemic has given us an opportunity to think about things, not just about um, life issues, but also more uh, professional concerns. And um, so we might want to go, go back to the origins of our, our vocation, I think, as trainers and as educators, to think about why are we doing what we're doing um, in a more general way. So uh, if we go back to the beginnings of um, educational theory, we start with uh, the notions of Aristotle. And Aristotle was talking, uh, was for, for Aristotle, for the Greeks, education was concerned with this word flourishing, or in Greek was eudaimonia. Um, and so the idea is that uh, what we do in, in classroom, in education, should not simply be an acquisition of knowledge, but above all, it should be a kind of training for life. Um, and uh, I suppose as language teachers, uh, we've all found it very difficult to adjust to um, doing what we do as language teachers, but doing it online, uh, it's much harder. So um, the, uh, the coronavirus crisis has provoked uh, a tremendous, um, tremendous problems for, uh, especially for schools, but also for universities. And they're really existential questions that we're asking about the future, because it seems that there's, there might there may be moves, political moves, to uh, encourage the development of um, new online services, even when the pandemic is finished. So in other words, the whole university uh, as an open public space where people, you know, people meet, people gather, people study, may be in question. Uh, and this is a social 
um, a social question rather than a specifically pedagogical one, but it has pedagogical uh, implications. Um, so yeah, this is what uh, the World Economic Forum was saying about it, that basically the pandemic has encouraged the, the opening of um, uh, online courses, um, which we, not ne without necessarily providing the, the kind of uh, training that would be necessary for teachers in those contexts. And of course, the question of research, what is going to happen to research in, in this new um, this new panorama is another question which we would do well to think about. So I thought I would um, think in a very practical way with you this afternoon, just about um, the stages of a language lesson and how possible it is to uh, reproduce these in an online context. So these are some of the things I'm sure which we all, uh, we all know. Uh, know about um, the different stages uh, that there may be in a language lesson. So, for example, um, most lessons begin with a warm up. You don't just uh, you don't just start teaching the present perfect or something. Dive right into your grammar point. You try to warm up the lesson. You uh, you try and find out what the mood of the class is. If they uh, if they seem happy today, if there were some problem students or something. Um, this is something that it's very difficult, if not impossible, to do uh, online, uh, I find anyway. Um, elicitation. So we, in other words, we don't teach something that they already know, but we kind of ask a few questions to check whether, uh, whether people are understanding, uh, understand the point already. We use the student's knowledge as a resource. And this can be more complicated, more difficult when you're uh, online. Um, you would then move to presentation, practice and production. I'm using this PPP model, which is, I'm sure you know, it's, a, it's quite an old fashioned model now, but it, it has the merit of simplicity. So it's an ideal that we can, that we can use to discuss um, how reproducible these aspects are in an online context. So presentation, you would introduce the language element. So for example, in this illustrated dialogue, we're doing the we're doing the the, the, the present continuous. Uh, so what is Jared doing in the picture? What is Usha doing, and so on. Um, and then you would practice this, of course. Your, you, the teacher would model the sentences, inviting the students to repeat them. You'd correct. You might do individual or, or choral uh, repetition. Um, you correct errors in grammar and pronunciation. Uh, you then uh, maybe use pointing at a student uh, and so on. You try and use the structure in, in, a, in a more controlled form. And then you'd move to this production, pre-production stage where you, um, for example, ask, well, what is your friend, what is your mother doing at the moment? And the, and the student tries to say, my mother is cooking at the moment or something like that. So this would be a kind of, the kind of stages that we would go through in a typical language lesson. And of course, um, from that, I think it's possible to see that there, it'd be very difficult indeed to reproduce those stages online. Um, a lot of these things are simply not possible. A lot of teaching depends on those su that subtle interplay, that subtle interaction, which goes on between teacher and students, students and students. Um, and it all happens in, in the classroom, in a physical classroom, in a very in a more natural way, not an entirely natural way, but in a more natural way than is possible in the online context. Um, so I, what I did was when I was preparing this project, I, I, um, I prepared a questionnaire and I administered it to, uh, well, some colleagues, maybe 30 colleagues, I think, 30, 40 possibly colleagues, um, English, uh, not necessarily English, but language teachers. And I asked them, some questions about uh, how they were adjust adjusting to this new situation. And some of them were positive. I must say I was expecting more negative feedback, but I got quite a lot of positive uh, results. Um, for example, uh, G here, the, la the last one, I don't waste my time commuting to work. And the students are happy for the same reason. This is a practical advantage of online teaching. Um, 
D here, I'm able to do more or less everything I'd normally do in the classroom, one teacher uh, suggested. Um, students are interested, we're not face to face, but there's a familiar atmosphere. And, and I wouldn't say, I'm not going to say that, um, that online teaching is negative. I don't want to be only negative about online learning, but I must admit that there were more negative comments. Uh, and, and, and the saddest one, I think, and the, and the truest one, I think, from my perspective, I, is the A here, the first one. I feel a lot and useless. So the teacher feels in some way detached from the situation. They feel that they're not really doing their job in a, in a, perfect, uh, in a, perfectly, in, in a perfect way. And the last one here, again, there's no kind of real interaction. And I think it's the interaction that I would put the accent on. This is the, uh, the, the dimension that I personally find um, missing. Um, the G, G as well, I'm more tired, I'm even exhausted after online classes. Um, but I found that, that my, my, own, my own feeling was, was the, that um, A, that often I was sitting in front of the computer, talking at the computer, and there was, I was missing that feeling of interaction that I was having with the students on a day-to-day -day basis. So that um, even though I think uh, online teaching is in some way less work for the teacher, it's much less satisfying. Um, our students, uh, well, uh, personally, I'm suffering from Zoom fatigue. I don't know about you. I'm, I'm sure some of you will be, will be also suffering from Zoom fatigue. Everything is online, meetings, faculty meetings, department meeting conferences. Uh, and so we get into this state where um, we, we're just tired also because we use our computers not just for uh, working with students, but for research, for producing papers, for, um, for all kinds of other leisure activities as well, for films. And so we're moving towards a society, towards a world where everything uh, is moving uh, online. And if we are tired, if we are tired, we, we teachers are tired, the students will be even more tired. And so the students have the, the temptation simply not to, not, to, not to be present at the lessons. And so coming back to where I began with, this is um, what I go into uh, in my paper on this, uh, this subject, is the question of, as I said, eudaimonia and flourishing. Um, it seems to me that uh, as language teachers, we understand that uh, we're interested in human development. We're interested in helping our students to develop as people, uh, as individuals. Um, and language teaching is only part of that, learning to interact with each other, learning to communicate. These are strong uh, human qualities which they need in life and they will, uh, will benefit from all their lives. Um, as it says here, John Dewey says, education is a social process. Education is growth. But a social process means actual physical presence. Um, this is, I think, what is lacking in the online context. Um, and so I think if we're going to think of education as, or as um, trees, if we think of the tree metaphor, there are two kinds of tree on, in this final slide. Um, on the right, with the words, you have life, you have the tree of life, the tree of knowledge, and you have the different subjects stuck onto this tree. Um, so in other words, it's a vision of knowledge that is instrumental. Uh, it's simply, uh, it's, a, it's, 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 it's a less, less holistic model than the one on, on the left where the tree grows from within and uh, everything uh, takes place in a natural way, in, in, uh, in a way that the student is at the center of the experience um, and is growing. Uh, as Jane Willis said of language education, you're not building a wall brick by brick, but you're helping plants to grow. And so just to conclude and to thank you for your attention, um, I think it's important that in this time of COVID, uh, we uh, re-evaluate re -evalu our priorities as educators. We need to ask 
what are we trying to do, not just with language teaching, but what does it mean to, um, to educate, to be a teacher? Is it simply an instrumental business? Is it, uh, are, we going, are we moving towards a world where everything will be online? Where every, every, students, uh, business, everything will happen through the computer. What kind of students will we help to grow in, those situ in, the, in that situation, if that is to be the situation? Or are we going to go back, you know, where in inverted commas, back to a more holistic model where we actually do encourage physical contact, where we do encourage interaction between our students, between the teachers and the students uh, in, a, in, a, in a real learning environment, which is what I, I profoundly hope is going to happen. So I'll close with that and I'll thank you very much. Um, welcome questions and interaction with you. Thank you very much. Спасибо. Спасибо, Дуглас. Очень интересный доклад. И, к сожалению, не осталось времени. Thank you, Douglas. That's a very interesting presentation, but unfortunately, we have no time for discussion. I hope that we'll be able to communicate in some other environment of networking. And thank you for affecting, for touching upon the subject of um, teachers' emotions in this distant, uh, in this new environment, uh, and how teachers are prepared to work in different conditions. And uh, we'll have another presentation on a similar subject by Verona Krul Gerd, who is from the Krakow Pedagogical Institution. And she's going to speak about university students' expectations uh, of methodological training in Krakow for special educational needs. Uh, of uh, taking part in this wonderful uh, conference and exchange of ideas. Um, first of all, I would like to ask you if you can see my uh, screen with the presentation. Okay, okay. So the topic of my presentation is university students' expectations of methodological training in teaching English as a foreign language for special educational uh, needs. Uh, let me start with a uh, short introduction to the whole presentation. Uh, so teachers working in uh, inclusive educational settings play multiple roles, which often go beyond mainstream expectations. So even the basic knowledge of the characteristics of various special educational needs and the awareness of the possible uh, challenges are essential to be able to respond to individual developmental and educational needs, as well as psychophysical abilities of pupils, which foreign language teachers are expected to do by the Polish uh, ministerial uh, directives. Uh, such competences are also vital in order to read and understand with comprehension the diagnosis issued by a psychological pedagogical counseling centers and to participate in the creation of individual educational therapeutic uh, programs. Uh, what needs to be um, emphasized is also the underlying truth that the presence of a philologist in an inclusive classroom is not restricted to teaching the foreign language, but it should also be uh, kind of a supportive uh, pro-therapeutic work, which in some cases of children may turn out to be salutary from the psychological, motivational, cognitive and linguistic points of view. Uh, the aim of the presentation is to depict the current situation in, in Poland and to share the uncertainties, needs and expectations of pre-service English teachers whose awareness about the potential uh, challenges of working in inclusive educational settings has been raised in a pilot uh, in a pilotage course during uh, introduced at the Pedagogical University of Krakow. Uh, here is a, a short quotation from the European Commission supporting um, why uh, foreign um, language um, education and, and inclusion are important. So. Uh, let, let me just uh, quote. So language learning is for everybody. Only a very small minority of people has physical, mental, or other characteristics that make language learning impossible. Provisions for learners with special needs of one kind or another is increasingly being made within mainstream schools and training institutions. However, 
such learners are still excluded from language lessons in some cases. Good practice in teaching languages to learners with special needs can be further developed and new methods and approaches um, need to be developed for the teaching of foreign languages to such learners. Uh, when it comes to Poland, um, what are the teacher uh, qualifications required in order to teach English or any other foreign language to young learners with special educational needs? So, uh, first of all, um, mainly uh, the training is provided um, by in the field of study called English philology usually in other languages known as English studies. And within, within English studies, there can be the teaching English specialization or applied linguistics in English, uh, during which um, future teachers can choose the teacher's specialization and acquire general qualifications for becoming an English teacher. Um, as part of the studies, also they can enroll for some um, postgraduate courses or programs or qualification cor courses. Uh, it is also possible to become an English teacher having graduated from any other field of, sp of study on condition that one has obtained uh, general pedagogical qualifications, has got an adequate confirmed uh, level of uh, command in a foreign language, uh, but there is no additional need of having separate qualifications in special education, in the special educational needs, which means that uh, theoretically an English teacher may come to, to the classroom without having much knowledge about particular special educational needs. And responding to that, um, at the pedagogical, uh, our university in, in, uh, in Krakow, the pedagogical university, was one of the very first ones in Poland uh, in which a special course devoted to uh, special educational needs in English language classroom was introduced. And also, uh, by the way, in our uh, university, the first postgraduate course devoted uh, specifically to teaching uh, English to learners with special educational needs was uh, was created, was offered, uh, the first one in the country. Okay, but coming back to this uh, pilot course, uh, it was introduced as early as in the 2015-16 uh, academic year, uh, lasted for and, and is being continued. Also, um, uh, currently, it's a little bit modified and it also covers uh, teaching students with special educational needs, not only in the real in-class environment, but also in this digital uh, online uh, space, yes, responding to the current situation of, of, the, of the pandemic. But this was the original course lasting for uh, 30 hours. You can see on the right side um, the plan, the schedule of the meeting, so covering different uh, special educational needs and suggesting different uh, ways of teaching such learners. Um, during the first course, uh, 21 students took part. Uh, 20 of Polish and one of Ukrainian uh, origin these way, these were MA uh, students. After the completion of the course, they were asked to complete a written questionnaire consisting of some questions with relation to, to the course. So what were the answers? Um, the vast majority of respondents, 90%, uh, confirmed that they felt that such a course was needed as part of, of the uh, preparation for English teachers to know something uh, about children with special educational needs and how to work with them. Um, they were asked why they feel that such a course is needed. So um, these are the, the main responses. You can also see the percentage in the brackets. So these were the, the reasons provided by the uh, pre-service teachers. So teacher, first of all, uh, teachers should be aware of the pupils' problems and needs and have basic psychological knowledge in the field of special educational needs. Next, teachers should know how to behave, how to deal with class management and how to organize lessons in, in inclusive educational contexts. Also, teachers should develop the sense of preparation, should become an open-minded and should uh, not be afraid to approach children with various special educational needs. Uh, also, more and more children are being diagnosed and learn foreign languages at the same time. And last but not least, 
it is a good starting point for further study, for example, a recommendation of uh, literature. Um, okay, the next question was, what should the course include? So was there anything missing? What else would you like to learn about? So most uh, students replied that uh, the course should include um, some kind of a knowledge about diagnostic symptoms. So pupils with sense weaknesses and, and strengths. Um, teaching specific te the suggestions of some spe specific teaching methods and techniques for the classrooms. Um, uh, also, how to approach uh, children with SAN in a supportive way, how to react appropriately, how to behave and what to avoid in the classroom. Uh, also, they would like to get some tips on, on uh, material adaptation, teaching uh, resources, the adaptation of teaching resources, the modifications to different types of special educational needs. Uh, also, where to get assistance from, for example, the cooperation with other specialists, such as speech uh, therapists or psychologists working with the children. Uh, how to approach children in a supportive way in general. Also, they would like to uh, know more about some ministerial directive, do formal documents, uh, which uh, give some requirements as for the classroom work. Um, the next point which the course should include should be how to motivate pupils with special educational needs to learn the foreign language, um, how to stimulate them, and what to find, where to find more information about SEN in case they need uh, to, to read more, and how to analyze psychological, pedagogical diagnosis, children's documentation, because when children are being diagnosed by specialists, there may appear certain concepts uh, terms that with which which may not be so familiar to general English teachers, so they should have some background knowledge also uh, with reference to that. Uh, how should the course be organized? So uh, students claimed that there should be a, co a combination of theory in the classroom, but also they suggested for more teaching uh, practice. So not only uh, lessons in the classroom, but also going to schools and observing um, uh, in practice, right? It should cover lesson observations, like optional. Um, it should be, um, yes, going to schools. Of course, as part of general English uh, studies uh, for the teaching specialization, uh, students have some kind of teaching practice, but not necessarily in inclusive educational settings. Uh, this is a kind of a lag they pointed, uh, they pointed to. Um, have you ever had any contact with SEN learners before? Um, yes, uh, the students replied. So in the workplace, some of them were already uh, giving some kind of, a, for example, private tuition or, or, or had some experience in, uh, in work with in schools. During teacher practice, also they encountered such learners. Uh, some cases also in the family and in other contexts. Uh, so coming to uh, conclusions from, 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 from this um, study and from the, our introduction of this novel course, a course at our university. Uh, so the creation of plurilingual mentality, so allowing SING learners not only to learn and develop their first language, but also learn, study other foreign, foreign languages, L2, L3. Um, so a positive uh, outlook on languages and cultures and the learning of them is important and can be implemented, developed from the plurilingual potential, which is present through, though, which is present in Poland, uh, though not widely recognized in our country, because our country, Poland, is still quite uh, a monolingual uh, environment. But the presence of an increasing number of new immigrants, especially from Ukraine, is a further factor in such a policy. Um, numbers are still relatively low, but likely to increase. And also we have uh, more and more uh, immigrants, uh, Polish immigrants from the UK, for example, from Great Britain coming back to, 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 to Poland with children being born in, um, in the UK, but they start the education in Poland. So they have Polish parents, but have already developed a, a competence in English. 
Um, English is dominant as the first foreign language on all le levels of the educational system in Poland. In order to make progress, as far as linguistic diversity is concerned, it is vital to give as many pupils as possible, uh, regardless of the disabilities of, or dysfunctions, the access also to second foreign language learning. At the same time, pre-service teachers need to get appropriate uh, preparation and training. Um, and the presence of a philologist in an inclusive class classroom is not restricted to teaching the foreign language. As I said at the beginning, it should also be a kind of a supportive work, uh, looking also from the psychological, motivational um, and general developmental uh, perspective. Uh, so, uh, MA students found the pilot course devoted to teaching English as a foreign language to learners with special educational needs useful and needed, and that thus it is being continued at our new university uh, with a slight change that it's uh, it has been adapted to suit their the, their expectations as well as the novel situation. So. Uh, from the last uh, year, uh, academic year on, the course is called Special Educational Needs in Language Learning Off and uh, Online. Um, thank you very much. Thank you for your attention. If you have any further questions, you got interested of, or if you have any kind of experience in uh, working with special needs learners in your country, or if you run similar courses at your universities, I would be grateful and I would be very, very happy to get in contact, uh, got, get in touch with, with you. So here is my email address, just in case you would like to share some experiences with, with me, for which I would be very grateful. Thank you very much. Um, um, thank you. Спасибо, Верона, спасибо. Очень важные вопросы профессиональной подготовки. И... Верона, you've touched upon a number of uh, extremely important uh, issues. Uh, our next paper will also deal uh, with uh, uh, professional education and the degree of uh, uh, readiness. Uh, and I would like uh, to invite Mr. Gagarin for the presentation who uh, represents Mgimo. Uh, good afternoon, colleagues. My, my talk is uh, uh, to do with the um, advance, uh, uh, keeping ahead of labor market challenges and teaching foreign languages at high school. And this fear of higher education, um, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Времени. And uh, um, particular importance uh, uh, is given to foreign languages, uh, and uh, uh, we must design such courses uh, that would uh, reflect the changing situation uh, in the labor market, which will uh, inevitably be faced by our graduates. And uh, uh, we should uh, um, decrease to a maximum the time gap between graduation and employment. Uh, and, uh, uh, we uh, must um, operate uh, in the situation of this new reality, and uh, um, this has uh, to do with keeping ahead uh, uh, of uh, developments uh, in the sphere of education. And uh, we should focus uh, on the methods of designing uh, um, courses uh, and uh, syllabuses that would uh, enable us to um, respond uh, um, more efficiently to the changing expectations of employers. Uh, that means uh, with 
got to uh, design our um, courses accordingly and supplement them with tasks uh, and assignments uh, that would lead us to the desired outcome. Uh, however, uh, there are both advantages uh, and uh, uh, weaknesses here, strengths and weaknesses. Uh, uh, the um, uh, learners are interested uh, in uh, obtaining quality education uh, through mastery of lexicon and grammar. However, the uh, university may be interested uh, in um, such type uh, of uh, education that would um, make uh, the graduate uh, competitive competitive and highly employable. So the content uh, of uh, foreign language curricula um, is closely linked to, to the choice uh, of texts uh, to include in the design course uh, in uh, um, these uh, contradictions that uh, become uh, evident uh, could uh, be um, decreased uh, or even altogether eliminated. Uh, this means we have to rethink uh, our uh, curricula uh, and that um, uh, pertains to both uh, vocabulary and uh, um, contextual input. And uh, we should look at it both from the point of view of uh, uh, quality and quantity and to ensure uh, consistency and continuity of our curriculum uh, from um, a junior um, um, undergraduates uh, all through uh, graduate students uh, to postgraduate level. However, uh, among the uh, disadvantages, uh, we should focus uh, on uh, uh, considerable uh, demands uh, for um, effort uh, and time uh, needed uh, to implement this comp. Uh, competence. However, perhaps we could look at the artificial intelligence as a tool to facilitate our effort. And uh, we uh, could also um, suggest um, a um, integrated approach uh, in the organizing this work. Uh, in uh, um, collecting and analyzing the statistics uh, needed for this kind of effort. Uh, today, uh, what with the new tools of information search, we have uh, the opportunity to um, address new challenges uh, to uh, design materials uh, that would uh, meet uh, the necessary criteria uh, in the at the same time, we would uh, maintain uh, uh, the systemic uh, and consistent approach to um, course designing, but um, a review and the supplementation of the existing uh, curricula uh, may, mm, to a maximum extent, respond uh, uh, to the realities of life and to the changing reality. Uh, the, so to say, ready-made uh, pre-designed uh, uh, modules uh, could be reactivated uh, and uh, adapted uh, ahead in tune with the expectations of the employer. And uh, what's more, students uh, could decide on what's more uh, necessary uh, based uh, on their personal preferences uh, and interests. But uh, that would uh, dictate for the need uh, of uh, um, revision of the existing mechanisms at the federal level. Thank you for your attention. Uh, um, thank you, Sergei.
Thank you, Sergey. That was a wonderful idea you proposed uh, as a starting point for a project. I do hope uh, you will be able to implement it uh, despite uh, the existing um, obstacles. Uh, we are now moving to the level uh, of business uh, innovations uh, and uh, Olga Strelnikova, uh, who represents Mugino, is welcome with her presentation. Um, and I'm going to share my screen to show my presentation. Can you see it? All right. So my name is Olga Strelnikova, and I will be speaking about the business innovations that could be used in education. I will be using some uh, images from a uh, from a motion pic picture uh, by Pixar. If you know its name, could you write down the, its name in the chat? <laughs> Thank you. So nowadays, uh, most teachers are likely to be driven by the necessity to look for new ways of increasing student motivation, as in today's world, a growing number of students tend to be suffering from information overload and a short attention span. But in language lo learning in particular, motivation is everything because studying a foreign language is a never ending process. It takes a lot of time and effort and what a student needs uh, to master a foreign language is the drive and motivation to find out about its nuances in and out of class. Although innovations, that is new methods and ideas are already abundant in education, teaching a foreign language can be made even more effective if we bring <coughs> some examples of business innovations and good business practices to the classroom. This will not revolutionize your teaching style, but it will certainly make your classes more tailored to the needs of modern state students modern day students. Here are some suggestions. Uh, to begin with, there is a tendency for successful bloggers, film producing companies and uh, brands to kickstart their shows and campaigns with a preview of the most thrilling events or a quick look at a surprising plot twist which catches the viewer's attention. How can it be used in education? The beginning of your classes can be altered to be breathtaking and captivating to get your students to look forward to learning more. So instead of reciting all the things in the lesson plan at the beginning of the class, which I personally do quite a lot, uh, you can capture your students' attention by asking a question to reveal their lack of knowledge in some subject area or by showing them some thought-provoking statistics. Moving on to the way business uses interesting ways to attract the uh, customer's attention. For example, nowadays, quite a few restaurants often uh, offer some form of entertainment to their visitors and invite them to watch a show rather than enjoy some food and drinks uh, while watching it. How can it be used in education? Uh, teachers need to create more opportunities for project-based and task-based learning. It is already being done to some extent, but it might also be introduced in textbooks, for example. It is common knowledge that today uh, students tend to be focused on studying the things they need for an exam rather than some information for their general education. So a textbook can be made in such a way that the student immediately sees the task they could do by reading the, task, uh, the text below it, rather than they read the text first, study some facts and vocabulary, and only later see the tasks they could do better by reading the given text. The task, the task before the text, such as read the text below, be ready to make up a speech about the advantages of the described approach based on the text, can make your students see the motivation behind reading the text. If a student is not reminded they can find the necessary information in the given text, they can fail to see the connection between the task, uh, text and the task and start looking for the required information on the internet, which is a frequent problem. Some internet businesses are also pioneering innovations to attract new customers. For instance, the Russian online recruiting company Headhunter, you can see the picture on the, sli on the slide, 
so it provides a special service for people looking for a job, which is an elegantly designed, uh, designed template for creating a perfect CV. In their version, it's a resume, by adding some, some information about your background, experience, uh, etc. So how can it be used in education? Teaching students skills which they know will be helpful even after they graduate offers them a unique opportunity not only to enlarge their knowledge, but learn some new skills too. Uh, for example, teaching students to write a motivation letter, which Headhunter, for example, is not teaching its customers yet, or to make an elevator, uh, elevator pitch. And an elevator pitch is uh, a short but effective explanation that is intended to persuade someone to buy a product or accept an idea, according to the Cambridge Dictionary. Um, so it's also very useful. Teaching new skills lets your students do these important things successfully in the future, and it gives them the added motivation to study. Another business innovation which could be used in education is customization. It is quite common for all kinds of modern companies today to customize their products. Customizing means modifying something to suit a particular individual or task. For example, you can customize your Apple iPods earphones now by engraving them with a text or an emoji. Tiffany and company does it too, and you can see an engagement ring here. In this way, the customer feels it is their unique item made specially for them. How can this be used in education? It could be used to tailor students' workbooks, for example, to their needs. So a workbook is usually not to be used for tasks, but it serves to expand a student's knowledge and enlarge their vocabulary. So the workbook could be customized. The online workbook can be made up of several units to choose from. The student chooses a number of units they would like to study based on their interests. This works like Lego, where the plastic construction toy consists of interlocking plastic bricks. The student compiles the chosen units online and gets their unique workbook. The topics given in the workbook, I think, must coincide with the topics of the course book, but they could probably be less global and less and a little simpler. For example, the course book itself comprises topics like family and upbringing, and in our customized workbook, we have units like family patterns in Russia, the generation gap, etc. This customized workbook might be used specifically for weaker students as they might fall behind the other students in their group, but they still need to improve their English. So to sum it up, to sum it up these are the business innovations and practices that could be used in teaching a foreign language. Using te teasers, using grammar and vocabulary as a means, not a goal. So this is uh, project-based uh, uh, learning. Uh, teaching students new skills and customizing. Uh, thank you for your attention. Stay inspired. And if you have written that this is uh, a cartoon called Soul, this is the one. Uh, thank you for your attention. Here are the sources I have used. Uh, I would be happy to answer the questions. <laughs> yes, it is Soul, exactly. Уважаемые коллеги, я хочу поблагодарить we unfortunately well i regret to say that we have to draw the line our time has run out now there will be a short break for 15 minutes and after that you'll be able to join the round tables and other discussions uh, which are planned in accordance with the program of our conference thank you very much i'm very glad to see you all and hope that we will not lose track of each other and try to keep in touch Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for participation. Goodbye. Goodbye.